Hi everyone, I'm Mercedes with Rocky Nook. Thanks so much for joining us today and this for this webinar with Jeff Carlson on editing black and white photos in Luminar 4. Before we get started, I just want to mention a couple of things real quick. If you don't already have Jeff's book, The Photographer's Guide to Luminar 4, uh, you can purchase that on the Rocky Nook website and we are offering a coupon code for 40% off. That code is Luminar40 when you add that at checkout on rockynook.com. Don't worry if you don't remember that, I'll put that in the chat. And also that will be in an email we're gonna to send to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll send you an email that includes that coupon code and also the replay link for this webinar. So in case you miss anything or you wanna go back and watch it again, or this time didn't work out for you, you have to leave early, don't worry. Tomorrow we'll email you a link so you can watch this all again. So again, our webinar today is with Jeff Carlson on black and white photos in Luminar 4. And if you do already have Jeff's book, The Photographer's Guide to Luminar 4, it would really help us and Jeff out if you leave a review about the book on Amazon. Let us know what you thought and how it helped you. And it also helps other people figure out if that's the right book for them for learning Luminar 4. Uh, so one last thing I just want to mention is, as Jeff's presenting today, go ahead and submit your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box as you have them. We'll get to all those questions at the end, but you don't have to save them for the end. You can submit them at any time. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we can I am not able you. to start. Yep, we can hear you, but we can't see you yet. It says that the host has stopped me from sharing my video, oh my so I think Let's I'll see. just take that as a editorial comment and uh, there we go. Sorry all right, here that. we are. <laughs> no worries at all. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for showing up to this. Uh, as Mercedes said, we are going to be talking about uh, editing black and white photos in Luminar. Um, quick couple of things to get out of the way. First of all, um, remember there's a code if you want to order the book. Uh, there's that's what the book looks like. Um, also, if you do own the book, uh, especially if you own the print book, we made the images in the walkthrough chapters, uh, chapters two and three, three and four. Anyway, the first walkthrough chapters, uh, by popular demand, we made those available as a free download. So if you have the book and you want those images. Uh, the link should be in the ebook version, uh, but uh, it didn't happen in time enough to get it into the print version. So send me an email, jeff at jeffcarlson.com, and I will send you the link. So, um, and that way you can just step through all the same steps that, that I do as I do it. Um, the next thing I want to mention, uh, stupid technical zoom thing. Um, when I switch to Luminar, all the controls are on the right hand side of the window and sometimes zoom will pop up uh, a window of participants or chats over the top of that. So um, if that happens, just slide it off and then you'll be able to see uh, what I'm working on. So first of all, let's talk about why you'd want to work in black and white. Um, obviously, it's, it's a classical look. This is how photography started. Um, and, you know, for the longest time, black and white uh, was the only thing you could do. And then color came and then, woo, color, color's great. Yeah. There are a lot of people who to this day think, you know, it's not really photography if it's not black and white. That's kind of an extreme position. But, um, you know, there's something just like inherently photographic about black and white that um, just adds something to landscapes and portraits. And um, what's great in this case, it's another tool that you can use for your photos. So sometimes you may be shooting and composing in black and white in your head, or maybe you have a camera that will do like a black and white simulation so you can see it uh, as you're shooting. Uh, there are some situations where, you know, maybe you have a whole lot of contrast and you just know that that will look good in black and white. Well, all our digital cameras capture everything in color. Uh, so we want to do something with that. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring that into Luminar and use Luminar's black and white controls to really optimize and finesse uh, what you can do in 
creating a black and white photo from a color one. And I say creating in a specific way because uh, yes, you can absolutely just, uh, you know, convert like there's a big convert to black and white button in every application. And you can do that and it removes all the saturation, makes it grayscale and woo, it's black and white. But if you know black and white photography, if you've seen, uh, you know, the works of the masters, uh, you know that it's not just a matter of removing the color. There's lots that you can do in terms of contrast. Um, in fact, um, color. Color actually plays a big part in black and white uh, conversions and black and white editing, which we'll get to. Um, I should probably also say um, one of the, the podcasts that I run, uh, sorry, the podcast that I run is called Photoactive. Uh, we talked extensively about black and white in episode three. You can go to photoactive.co and find that. Um, Kirk McElhern and I uh, we co-host this podcast and he's a huge uh, black and white fan and, and knows a lot more about the history of photography than I do. I'm sort of more on the practical side. Uh, anyway, if you want to check that out, we had a really good discussion and it comes up uh, quite a lot during the, the course of the, um, the podcast. Um, and the last thing I will also say, I am very much a realist. Sometimes black and white is really good for covering up mistakes. And it's sort of heresy to say that, but face it, like there've been some times where you've taken a shot and the color is just off or the white balance is off or just like, it's, it's not what you had in your head. But maybe the composition is really great. Maybe the contrast is really good. In that case, the, in that case, switching to a black and white uh, can actually improve the photo. Now, you know, you're not going to take a garbage photo and suddenly make it magical by converting it to black and white, but sometimes you can make a good photo into a much better photo by doing a black and white conversion. So that's all my, all my uh, introductory stuff. Um, let's switch to Luminar. Now, in this case, I am using Luminar uh, as a standalone app. Luminar can also work as a, a plugin. So if you use Photos on the Mac or uh, Lightroom Classic or Photoshop, for example, you can still use Luminar by taking your, your uh, photo and basically sending it using a plugin and then you edit it in Luminar and then it round trips back to the, the application that you use for organizing your photos. Um, if you look at my Instagram uh, feed today, I posted a picture that I shot with my iPhone and did this. I, I sent it to Luminar on the Mac and then um, did a black and white conversion and put it back. Uh, so it's still in my photos library, uh, but it has had a Luminar black and white edit applied to it. Um, that's, uh, sorry, on Instagram, I'm just at Jeff Carlson. So if you want to go check that out. Um, so here we are in Luminar. Now, where are we going to start? We'll start easy and then go into the more interesting, uh, interesting steps next. So um, a curious thing. So Skylum uh, which is the company that makes Luminar. Before Luminar existed, they had this great application called Tonality. And Tonality was an application solely devoted to uh, editing black and white photos. Now, Tonality has been retired in favor of Luminar, but you can actually get a lot of the same uh, effects and a lot of the same looks from uh, that, that they created in Luminar. So there is a, a um, just kind of look at my notes here. Um, it is called the Tonality Mega Black and White Pack for Luminar. Um, and uh, if, if you go to the Skylum website, skylum.com uh, slash Luminar slash marketplace slash looks slash 53. We'll try to uh, include that link in the, the, the YouTube notes or wherever this ends up, um, or just go to skylum.com and, and search for it. Uh, you can download these for free. And what a Luminar look is, is basically a preset. It's a preset that says, uh, you know, 
it's going to apply a whole bunch of edits and you don't have to do a thing and it's it's really pretty slick so i'm going to do that now with this picture i'm going to click looks up here and at least on my there we go i had to get rid of my own floating palette which i'm not sure that shows up on yours in the recording but we'll see okay so luminar looks we've got this this one right here that's selected called tonality basic and uh, I've, I've added a bunch of different looks. Some of them come with Luminar. Some of them you can download for free. Um, if you buy Luminar, you create an account, uh, it will point you to extra things that you can download. Um, in this case, we have like this tonality basic. Uh, I will also point out that there's a Rocky Nook looks that you can download and that's uh, linked in the book. So this tonality basic, um, these are just basically different um, settings that have already been set up. And when you move your mouse over the top of it, you should be able to see the different effects without actually applying them. This is a feature in Luminar 4.3 that was added, um, hoping that it's coming through on the, the video okay. Um, and basically, you know, you just go through and see what you like. Um, I'm gonna go with this uh, Barcelona. Click that and, you know, boom, you're done. Uh, if you wanted to, you could adjust the intensity of it. And so in this case, we're just kind of removing some of the saturation, but, um, you know, I'm looking for a full black and white conversion. Uh, this also, Madrid, that looks kind of interesting. Now, uh, if you have my book, you know that um, I am not a big proponent of looks um, or presets. Partially, that's just that, that sense of, well, you know, I've got all this, all this control, all this power. I want to manipulate an image the way I want it, not necessarily what somebody else says should it, it should be. Um, and uh, you'll also know that uh, I came to this realization that, okay, you know what, looks and presets... Uh, in, in Luminar especially, it's not just, oh, I can make this look like, uh, you know, Bob's version of a, an ideal black and white photo. What I can do is, uh, once you make a bunch of settings, you can save them as a new preset, I'm sorry, as a new look, and then uh, that way you can come back to it at any time. So it, it, it's almost like automation rather than just trying to you know, shortcut into some sort of different look. So if we go over here to the edit uh, panel, um, you'll see over here on the right, um, we've got a few different controls. If you're not familiar with Luminar, basically everything happens over here on the right hand side. Um, we are currently looking at the essentials controls and a couple of these have been um, highlighted. So the, the lighter ones mean that an edit has been applied. So in this case, it looks like the Madrid look has added a little bit of AI accent. It's added a black and white conversion. We'll get more into that in a minute. Uh, it's done a texture overlay and a slight glow. So even if you do apply a look, you can easily go back and say, oh, you know what? I'm not really a big fan of the glow portion of it. So maybe I will turn that off and see what difference that makes. So that's, that's kind of the nice thing about looks. Uh, they can either get you there quickly, get you to a, a specific look that you, that you want. Um, you can try out a bunch of different things or use that as a, um, you know, a starting point. Say, I really like, like maybe, you know, like a, a, a vintage look. Um, and then start from there. All right, so those are the looks. Now, let's go back into some, I'm gonna hide the looks for now. I'm gonna go back to our library, our grid. Now let's, let's jump into actually doing some, some conversions ourselves. 
Um, oh, and I should probably mention, um, feel free to uh, add questions in the chat. Uh, I can't see them while I'm screen sharing, but uh, we'll hit those at the end of, of this presentation. So um, please do ask questions and um, uh, Mercedes will jump in if there's anything that's especially on fire or something, but um, we will take a look at those. Okay. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, the convert to black and white button. Powerful, powerful stuff. So what I'm going to do here is uh, we'll just sort of reset this. This is the, the original image that I shot. Um, if you know me, if you follow me, um, I am a total sucker for beaded water on flowers, beaded water on anything really. Um, and, you know, by itself, this is a perfectly fine image. Um, I say fine because uh, there are a few things that immediately I can see that I want to change. And because we have like these beads, because we've got some texture to this flower, it uh, gives me an idea that this might be a really good candidate for a black and white image. So um, before we do that, I want to just apply some quick tone fixes. And the reason that this jumps out at me is A, this is a, a, a pretty dark image, right? Um, and I can look at that, I can tell by looking at the histogram. Um, again, if you've read my book, you know I'm a big fan of using the histogram. And that's this section right up here at the top right. Um, and what this is telling me is that all the, all the, the values, all the color values, all the light values are sort of smashed up here against the left edge of the histogram. That's the darker edge. And so if I wanted to, like say, I could just go into AI Enhance or no, I'm going to go into to light. Uh, if I wanted to, I could just increase the exposure. Now, as I do that, you'll notice, hey, it gets brighter. And as it gets brighter, that histogram stretches out. So that uh, ideally, like, like this is actually a pretty good histogram. If you're just looking at the histogram, because we've got some values on the dark end, uh, we've got a lot of values in the middle and, uh, you know, it stretches almost all the way to the right, which is basically pure white. The, the far left is pure black. Um, and like just looking at the histogram, you'd think, hey, this is a pretty, pretty well exposed image. Well, when we look at the image itself, now that's, that's way too exposed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just reset that. And one of the things that I like to do is um, instead of increasing exposure, which just blasts light all over the place, uh, I like to click the advanced settings and start with whites. And that's, that just kind of, that brings up the brightness without all of that, that, that heavy handed exposure. Um, in this case, it's still pretty dark. So I'm going to add a little bit of exposure, but you can see the histogram is stretching out without going overboard. And maybe I'll just reduce the blacks a little bit to, to make that just slightly more contrasty. And you're thinking, you're, you're thinking to yourself, um, Jeff, we haven't done anything with black and white here yet. Maybe you're going to get to that eventually. Um, I want to sort of get a good baseline here because, you know, we'll be able to do all sorts of edits uh, once we convert it to black and white. But here, like, like just getting basic good tone is, is always my starting point. Now, um, the thing that I want to really convey from this, if you, if you think of nothing else, uh, remember nothing else from this, I want you to think that when we're editing in black and white, you're actually editing in color. And I'll show you what that means. So now that I've got my light, uh, my basic exposure values set. Uh, I'm going to go over here to the Essentials panel and I'm going to click the black and white conversion. Now here it is, the big convert to black and white. And we click it and it's black and white. And we're done. Thank you all very much. No. This actually did a few things that uh, I'm not entirely happy with. So because that, that, that red is such a, a, you know, like a dark color by itself, uh, this flower no longer pops the way it did. 
um, just sort of turn this off for a moment so you can see the comparison. Like, like the color really explodes. You turn it to black and white, kind of, kind of fades into the background. So just converting to black and white by itself only gets us part of the way there. But all these sliders, these luminance sliders in the black and white conversion uh, tool, this is where you have a lot of control over how your black and white appears. Again, many times you can click convert to black and white and it'll be great. But what we're doing is, even though we're only seeing black and white, the, the image information in that photo is still there. Like, like what is red, what is yellow, what is green? And so because of that, we can adjust the exposure of those, uh, those channels, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, the red, let's just hit that right away. Um, if I move the red slider, it is only adjusting the red and sort of like close to red values. So when I increase it like this, well, suddenly that row, the, uh, sorry, tulip, that flower, uh, that flower uh, suddenly becomes more prominent. Now, maybe I want it to be even darker. Like maybe the, the prominence of it is, I, I really want to show that this is a dark colored uh, flower. Um, in this case, I, I do want to bring it up. Now, if this had been like a yellow tulip, then maybe I wouldn't have the same issue. Uh, but because we're in black and white and now we're looking at, at tone and texture rather than sort of relying on, on the big pop of, of red as a color to draw attention, then I definitely want to adjust this red. Now you notice in the background, uh, very little, if anything, changes because of course, uh, the background is not red. In fact, we can switch to our before and after so we can see the difference here. Um, looks like, like there might be a little bit of, of, of red in this, a uh, little bit of branch, but not significant. So uh, this is what we have for our, our flower. Now, uh, because the background is green, we can also adjust some of that. So maybe we want, we want to raise the green values, or maybe we want to darken them. Uh, maybe we'll darken like some of the blues and the cyans. And even though there's nothing that really looks cyan, uh, you know, colors all blend. So sometimes a moving cyan will actually, uh, you know, produce more of an effect than you might expect. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to go with the, the very scientific, highly precise method here of drag the sliders all over the place and see what happens. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's too rigorous for some of us, um, but in this case, uh, quite honestly, like this is how you edit. You, you, you look and you see what works. Now, I like this quite a bit actually. And I think I'm going to leave that as it is. Now, we're dealing with uh, Luminar as a full editing application. So uh, yes, you know, we, we've done a black and white conversion. We've done some tonal editing. Uh, but of course, we have like all of the other tools available to us. So for example, um, I can go up here to uh, AI structure. And AI structure adds clarity of the other applications uh, call this clarity. And the, the AI portion of it specifically refers to if you have a person in the image, uh, normally with clarity, if, if, if there's a person in the image, then uh, you increase the clarity and they look terrible because it, it just accentuates every single wrinkle and fold and, and, and everything bad. Um, what AI structure does is it says, oh, there's a person there. We don't want to apply the clarity to the person. Uh, and so it, it's a really good way of like uh, adding more clarity to a background, for example, and, and not have to then go and, and fix the person. Um, that's an aside, of course, because we don't have any people here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to increase the AI structure. And what this is doing, this is uh, adding more contrast, more uh, local contrast. If we zoom in here, you can see uh, 
um, you know, part of, of, of what I'm going for in this image is to really make those, those droplets pop because that's like, to me, that's, that's the most interesting thing about the image. So we can uh, increase our AI structure. We can go to details enhancer and apply a little bit of sharpening, maybe uh, increase the small details. Um, and again, I apologize. I'm not sure how well this will come across in Zoom. Sometimes uh, little details when they get compressed <laughs> to, to be broadcast uh, don't always work really well. Um, if you rewatch this, hopefully uh, you'll see more detail. But um, even so, I think you can probably see what's the, you know, some of the differences that we're making on this image. So now I've got an image that has plenty of contrast. Uh, the, the tones are a lot better. And it just, you know, in my mind, is a better black and white image because we've done some specific things to it to enhance that, that, that black and whiteness of it, if that makes sense. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do, just because I can't help myself, um, compositionally, I think uh, the, the branches and stuff over here on the left is a little too distracting. So, um, and because this is fairly nicely symmetrical, I'm going to go to the crop tool. And uh, so up here in the canvas menu, say crop and rotate. Um, if you're running version 4.3, this looks a little bit different than uh, earlier versions, uh, this tool does. And um, this is something that they just changed a couple of weeks ago. So this is going to look a little bit different than what it does in the book. Um, I put a, a post at jeffcarlson.com that, that talks about the differences between what's in Luminar 4.3 and what's in the book. Um, nothing super serious, but you know, you can still see how this works. I'm going to change the aspect ratio to one to one square and bring that in and click done. And that is I think a pretty good black and white image. Let's do a quick before and after. So there, there it is in red, great in red, sounds good. Um, but uh, I, I really like this as black and white. And if you look over at the histogram, you can also see that um, you know, we've, we've spread out that tone. Um, we could probably even go a little bit further to the right if we wanted to by increasing, uh, like increasing the whites. Um, th th this is kind of an interesting, uh, not phenomena, but an interesting effect that you'll find when you start editing black and white photos. Um, even if you make the, the tonal changes in color, sometimes that will uh, need to be either reinforced or re-edited once you go to black and white, because of course uh, you're not taking into account all of the, the color. So in this case, I'm gonna, like maybe I am going to stretch out the white just a little bit. And there we go. So that is basically like the nuts and bolts of, of using the black and white conversion. Um, again, it's, it's important to understand that, um, you know, just converting to black and white is really only the first step and where you really can get creative and and you know, find that that black and white image that you know is there or that you had in your head. Uh, you, you do that by moving the luminance sliders. Uh, there's another slider here, or sorry, another control I should point out real quick. Um, the saturation slider, sorry, saturation control that has the saturation sliders. Uh, this is the problem when you write books about uh, this stuff because you're like, all right, what's a slider? What's a panel? Um, and what saturation does is that returns color to the image if you want to have like a, a, a blend. So for example, we could, uh, we could bring some of the red back in and it's only doing the red. Okay, let's go to another, another image. Um, Look at this, this picture of the mountains. Now this is an example, uh, like I said, um, this is a perfectly fine image. Uh, it, on its own, it's not super great. Um, in fact, 
I'm not entirely happy with the composition, but it has that, that, that thing of, of, oh, that's really descriptive. It has, <laughs> what, what am I trying to say? Like these sorts of, of, of craggy, uh, just stone mountains without uh, any vegetation on them, like really appeal to me in terms of a, a, a black and white conversion. So let's do that. Um, and in this, this case, I'm gonna convert to black and white, just go straight to it. And, uh, you know, that looks fine. But uh, this area of here, this area of sky is really just kind of blah. So, well, we know what color the sky is. So if we change the blue slider, we can make that a little bit more prominent, which I think balances out a little bit on the, of the, the crag on the right. Uh, maybe we can adjust the cyan a bit. I don't know that we're gonna see a lot of change in the mountains themselves because they're already fairly grayscale. Uh, maybe some of the green, nope, not even some of the green. All right, so that's fine. Um, and we can say, uh, oh, also I should probably mention that like the AI enhance, which is the basically the, the make better slider um, also works in black and white. And so we'll see what, what uh, Luminar thinks should be done. Yeah, that, that's okay. I'm gonna go do my own thing. So I'm gonna go back to, to the light panel. I'm gonna increase the whites. I'm gonna really decrease the blacks maybe bring up the shadows a little bit and just just make this even more contrasty because also one of the good things to remember about editing photos uh we don't necessarily have to think about whether this is you know uh documentary accurate of, of what we saw i mean you know as a photographer you are also an artist and for something like this like i really want that 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 darkness to it, um, you know, but, you know, like all these 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 rich dark veins in the rocks, I think, are really interesting and pop out. Now, uh, another thing about black and white photography, uh, historical, traditional black and white photography, is film grain. Now, film grain is kind of an interesting thing in the digital realm because uh, obviously we don't have grain in the sense of you know, actual physical particles that are on the film that make up the emulsion of the film. So uh, what we have is noise and noise is not the same thing. Noise is basically you know, a, a computer generated artifact. Uh, typically when your, your ISO is set pretty high um, and it's just not the same. So what we can do is, let's see this image, if I look at the info pane, is this gonna tell me? So yeah, so I shot this at ISO 160 uh, at F8. So there's not, I, don't, I, I mean, there's basically no noise here. So I can't even think, oh, well, I'm gonna, you know, sort of uh, play up the noise and call it film grain. Um, that just won't work. What I can do, however, is go to these creative tools and of course, there is a film grain slider. And what this will do is just let us add grain. And fortunately, um, it's not just adding noise. It is, you know, th there's an algorithm involved that's, that's trying to make it look like film grain. And again, um, not really sure how this is going to show up uh, over a compressed video stream. So I'm going to really crank it over crank this just to make sure that we can see it. Uh, but like this is definitely grainy. And if I wanted to, I could click the advanced settings and change the texture of the grain. So maybe I want, I want the grain to be like really gloppy, right? So I can increase the size, increase the roughness. And that is clearly overdoing it, but overdoing it for effect. We can really see it over here in this cloud. Now, if we were to you know, make this a little more, uh, more reasonable, if you were to print this out, then it would simulate 
a nice black and white grain. So that is, um, I would probably crop this a little bit more, but instead, let me jump to one more photo and go back to the ground and show you uh, basically nothing super new in terms of black and white conversion, but what you can do more of uh, with a photo in Luminar like this. So uh, here's an image. I really like it. I've already converted it to black and white. And um, it is, click down here, black and white conversion. Um, this is just strictly the convert to black and white, uh, one click, that's it. Um, I love all, all the texture in the water and the sun reflecting, but as you can tell, this was shot in the middle of the day. Um, there's a, a big difference between the, the darks and the lights. If you look at the histogram, uh, things are really pushed toward the left-hand side uh, because I didn't want to overexpose the bright areas. Uh, you know, and that's, that's fine, except that the main subject here, uh, the two girls are, are just, they're just too dark, right? So what I'm going to do here is uh, jump a little bit into some advanced editing in the sense of uh, using layers. Uh, we did a webinar that just talked about layers and masks that you should check out at the Rocky Nook channel um, or at, at my, my site, jeffcarlson.com. What I want to do here is I'm going to create a new adjustment layer. And an adjustment layer basically says I can use any of the, the editing tools that will apply only to this layer. So, you know, if, if I wanted to, I could even do another black and white conversion, although that wouldn't make any sense. Um, I wanted to specifically just work the, uh, the, the, the color levels there, but I'm getting a little, little off track there. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna, so now that I'm on my adjustment layer, go to the light panel. And I'm going to, in this case, increase the exposure. And I'm going to increase the shadows especially. Now, what you're seeing here uh, may make you recoil in terror because, oh my gosh, all of the highlights in the water are just, they're blown. Uh, you know, and sometimes you want, you want that look, but it's, it's lost a lot a lot of the, the texture that I was looking for. So when I'm making these edits, I'm just specifically looking at increasing the exposure and, and the, the brightness just on the people in the photo. Because what that's gonna allow me to do now is, and again, uh, <laughs> if, if you watch any uh, photo editing webinar, this is the part where the person says, and I'm gonna do this really quickly because we don't have time to do it, a real, real fancy job of it. Um, what I'm going to do is, now that I've got the, the tone of them set the way I'd like, I just want this adjustment layer to apply to them. So what I'm going to do is go here to Edit Mask. I'm going to say Brush. And what this is going to allow me to do is once I start painting over them, So uh, Luminar, another new feature in Luminar 4.3 is that uh, once you start painting, it automatically gives you this, this little red uh, indication of where you're painting. So I'm just gonna do a real rough uh, paint here. And what I'm doing is I'm using a brush to just say all those edits that I just made, I just want to apply to the areas that I paint. So that when I let go, you'll notice that the background is still uh, where we started. So um, what you're seeing is the, the base layer showing through. And uh, the edits that I just made on this adjustment layer are only applying to the people. Um, now, if I wanted to, I'm gonna get off of this. I'm going to zoom in a bit because, you know, this is good, but now when I look at them, uh, they're just a little bit soft, right? I would like a little more detail in uh, their faces. 
And what I can do here is I can go to, as you've seen, the details enhancer. And uh, right now we are uh, making edits to the adjustment layer. And I'm gonna, again, sort of overdo this. But this is giving me some sharpness in their faces. It's also sharpening everything else, which we don't want. And so normally I'd say, okay, well now I can draw a mask and, and do all of that. Uh, but I don't have to do that. If you notice up here on the right in the light, uh, this little blob next to it, that is a small representation of what the mask looks like. So I can right click or control click this mask and say copy. And now with detail enhancer, I can say edit mask, I can go to my brush and instead of repainting and doing all of that, I can go up to the mask menu and say paste, <laughs> except Zoom's control is in the way. Hang on, I can say mask and paste. And so now the details enhancer also has the exact same mask. I didn't have to redo that at all. And now there's a little bit more definition on their faces and overall you get the effect that I was going for, which is a uh, nice, cool, contrasty texture background, but uh, you know, more light and highlight on the subject, which is the two women. Um, and of course, because I did it quickly, they also look slightly angelic because I didn't make a very good mask. So they're, they're sort of glowing, but you know, uh, why not? So that, that's kind of the, the, the real quick, um, not so quick uh, version of uh, editing in black and white. Um, I think now would be a great time for questions. And um, yeah. Hi, Jeff. We do have some questions ready to go. Excellent. Um, let's see. Frank asks, why do you want to add grain? To me, that makes an image worse. What's the rationale? Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, it's purely a sort of texture look issue. Like if, if you are really going for that, um, that, that sort of classic grainy black and white photo look, um, like film, film photo look, uh, that's what it's there for. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's an artistic choice, totally. Um, if, if anybody has shot film, um, you know, like you would shoot, sorry, you would choose film stocks uh, sometimes purposefully because you wanted, uh, you know, a, a certain grain to it. Um, so, it, you know, it's, I will admit film grain is not something that I turn to very often, but every once in a while it works. And sometimes, uh, and this is sort of counterintuitive and, and goes a little bit beyond what, what Luminar is, is able to do here. Uh, but sometimes adding grain can, what's a good way to put this? It can make up for some softness in an image. So if, if your image is slightly soft, you add some grain to it, it doesn't seem as soft. Um, I know professional retouchers will often, you know, add noise specifically because they can, rather than, than using, say, like a, a sharpening tool, um, they can use the grain to basically fool your eye to thinking that something is just slightly sharper than it is. I'm not a professional retoucher. So um, if, if there are retouchers out there who are like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is, is actually something that happens. Uh, and I think you touched on this before, but it looks like a couple of people are wondering about this again. Um, yes. They say, my Luminar doesn't have any looks. Do I manually download and install those? Am I, where, where do they find those? Oh, um, it should. Looks are, are definitely a feature. So um, you should be able to, let's open this again. Um, so there's, there's a button at the uh, top left that says looks, and that's, that's, uh, how you can make your, your looks appear. Um, or I think there's a, a view menu. Somewhere else it might be available. Um, if you don't have any looks at all, 
um, then something is a little screwy. Um, you can absolutely download uh, looks and add them. Um, but if you don't see any at all, that's, that's unusual. Um, I would say go to the file menu and say, uh, it says show Luminar looks folder and see what comes up there. It could just be that, that maybe there was something with the, with the installation that um, uh, it didn't, didn't quite catch or something. I saw uh, someone else in the chat just said that you need to have an open image to have the looks appear. So maybe that helps them. And also I just oh, yeah. say if, if they're, they're still having trouble with the looks, um, definitely it's something to contact Skylum or Luminar about and their tech support can help you too. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, let's see. A question arose in uh, the photo PXL forum about the color working space allowable in Luminar 4. Are conversions limited to sRGB, ARGB 98, or pro photo RGB? That is a very good question. Um, and I, I knew this. Um, Sorry, uh, I, I, I think uh, there's a section in the book that talks about this, uh, maybe in the, the exporting. Um, in terms of, of, of what it's, it's using for its, its active color space, is that right? Um, I'm not sure. I want to say Profoto uh, RGB, but it may be defaulting to sRGB. Um, that would definitely be a, a question for Luminar. I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. Very good question though. Is there a targeted, uh, excuse me, is there a targeted adjustment tool within the black and white conversion filter? Um, targeted adjustment, well, sort of. Um, so the way, the way Luminar does uh, targeted adjustments are with masks. And so um, every, actually every single tool um, with one exception has this edit mask uh, menu down here. And so um, if you wanted to, like, like let's say, let's get rid of this. Um, this is a little bit, like, like let's say you wanted to um, do a brush of the black and white conversion. What I need to do is I need to just reset the adjustments on this. Okay, I'm going to revert this to original. Um, and now if I want to say, I'm going to convert this to black and white, boop, but I really only just want this front thing in black and white. So I would, I would say edit mask, uh, choose brush or radial or gradient or what have you. And then do my little painting. And you'll see that only that that section. So in, in that sense, there's there's like the the, the targeted uh, that you're talking about. And so now I could say like, okay, I'm, I want to adjust the sliders for this. Okay. Now, um, what you could then do is um, like, let's say you want a different section. Like like maybe you want to. You want to really work on the, the the blues and the magentas in the flower section, but you want to do a different uh, black and white conversion for the little vase. Uh, what you could do in that case, I'm just gonna I'm gonna erase this part of the of the uh, mask. All right. Um, in that case, I'm gonna click done. Uh, then we create a new adjustment layer, go back to our black and white conversion, do another convert to black and white, and just you know, do something screwy to make it really obvious what I've done, and then make a new mask that just covers that one section. So what we have now is uh, we actually have two black and white conversions going on, but we have one black and white conversion with uh, luminance settings for the flower part 
and then another black and white conversion with luminance settings for the vase. And that's, that's enabled through layers, um, the, through having adjustment layers. Um, and also the, the fact that, that every tool and actually every layer, so the entire layer can have a mask, but also every tool can have a mask. The only exception to that is when you're on your, your base layer, uh, the light panel does not let you uh, create a mask because there's basically nothing underneath it. It would just be uh, darkness, I guess. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and you that kind of leads into the next question I have here, which you just did kind of touch on. Um, mm -hmm. but we can. So I think you could probably go over it again more briefly, which is uh, how would you go about converting an image to black and white while leaving a single color present? It looks like you kind of did the reverse of that just now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, um, let's, let's say uh, orange, right? Let's, let's say we, uh, I'm gonna just reset the adjustments on here. And um, like, well, let's say the only thing that I like is, is the purple, right? Crazy about purple. Um, and what I would do here is I would say black and white conversion. I would convert it to black and white. And um, either go to the saturation uh, control here and then just bring up, like, say, the magentas. And maybe, actually, maybe not even the blues, maybe just the magenta. And that, that just brings up that specific color. Or if I was looking more sort of object level, then I would create a mask, paint over the area that I wanted to, to uh, show up. Okay. And then I can go up to the mask menu and invert the mask. And that gives me uh, basically now everything else is hidden or sorry, everything else is, is, uh, has my conversion uh, applied except for this area here that shows through from the, from the, the, the original. Someone else asked, and I, I hope they'll chime in if, if your last two answers aren't covering their question, because I think it did. But he asked, okay. does, does Luminar 4 support making a mixed black and white and color photo? So if, if we didn't just cover that, go ahead and chime in and let us know more specifically what you're curious about. Um, yeah. That one covered that, let's see. Yeah, with, with layers and masks. Um, so Luminar is, is sort of interesting in the fact that um, like you don't have to do layers and masks at all to, to do editing and, and get some really great results. But if you know how to use layers and masks, uh, like you can really get deeper into different edits. And what's also nice is um, as far as I know, uh, like the only limitation for, for masks is, um, I'm sorry, for layers is um, like the, the amount of memory that uh, Luminar has available to it. So, um, you know, you can build really complicated layers um, that each have their own black and white conversion uh, effect applied or other other effects um, and you know r really fine tune things if if that's what you're looking for okay here's another question uh, let's see dj says i frequently have problems with banding in my digital black and white images suggestions how to minimize this either in luminar or in the camera settings um Surprisingly, um, film grain. Film grain uh, will often uh, sort of offset some of that banding. Um, I'm not sure what, what is, is causing the banding. It, like if the banding was there and then you did a black and white conversion and it just accentuated it. Um, but quite often um, adding, adding some noise, adding some, um, uh, some grain uh, will will offset banding. I'm going to see if there was, there was a way to like specifically add noise and there, there's not. Um, off the top of my head, that's, 
that would be the way to do it in Luminar. Um, although I'm not sure what would be causing the banding. Um, that like like if if that's something that's coming up a lot, um, it it might be the camera. I'm not sure. It it would be worth looking at the in like maybe a couple of different uh, applications and see how they're how they are uh, perhaps uh, interpreting the raw file or if it's just a JPEG file. Um, check and make sure that the the JPEG setting on the camera is set to high um, because it it could be. You know, like, like, for example, if you have a sky that's, that's pretty much just like a blue sky, a blue gradation, um, it, if the camera is set to uh, like, like medium quality for JPEG, uh, you might get more banding because the, 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 camera is, um, the camera is actively compressing the image. And JPEG compression is usually really good. Um, but I've seen that sort of thing happen where it's, it's trying to throw away data because that, that's what JPEG does. JPEG throws away data in order to make a smaller file size, which was very important back when, uh, you know, memory cards were eight megabytes, um, not so much now. So that could be another possibility that could be leading to the banding. Um, so check and see if it's happening also with raw images. Um, it would be less likely that raw images would show that. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of a scattershot answer because there, there are a few different things that could be contributing to that. Uh, next question. I often do much of my processing in Lightroom before sending the image to Luminar. Do you think Luminar does a better job of black and white conversion than Lightroom? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that I would say one is definitely better than the other. If you are looking for, um, if you're looking for like some of, of the specific looks, like that would be an easy way to, to, to round trip that. Um, I think that the, the advantage of using if you are already using Lightroom and the advantage of bringing Luminar into it would be to um, add either uh, to be able to work with layers and make, make take advantage of, of, of that sort of layers and masks, which, which Lightroom does not have. Um, or you want to use other tools like maybe AI enhance or AI structure or um, like, like, like the, the details enhancer. Uh, where you have a lot more uh, fine tuning over, you know, small, medium, large details versus just just sharpening. Um, so I can't I can't just say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like L Luminar does black and white much better than anything else. Um, the the stuff that I've shown here, um, you can also do in Lightroom with all the different color channels and all that. So. Um, it kind of depends on on your preference and which, you know, and try it in both and see what happens. I know that that's kind of a lame answer, but that's the truth. Uh, is it possible to use the AI sky replacements while still converting to black and white? Uh, yes. Um, I say that because I don't know that I have specifically done that, but let's try because we have it right here. All right, so here's, let me get rid of our looks. Um, we'll just see what this does. If I go to AI sky replacement, and it does see a sky. So let's just say we want dramatic sky three. Yes. So um, it will uh, do the sky replacement. And because uh, we also have a black and white conversion uh, happening over here in the uh, essentials tools, uh, that also gets applied. Okay. Is dodge and burn useful for black and white? Yes. Uh, yeah, dodge and burn can be great for black and white. Um, I, I did a little bit of that with the, with the masking, like, like in a real, uh, uh, 
sort of heavy handed way. Um, but yeah, th there is a dodge and burn tool. And basically for, for people who don't know, dodging and burning is like making something either lighter or darker on a more uh, sort of specific level. Um, so for example, like um, if I want to lighten, like let's say I just want to lighten this area right here. Um, then there we go. Uh, this also a very ham-handed uh, effort, but yeah, um, it, dodging and burning um, also traditionally used in black and white photography. Um, when you're you're getting down at that level of okay, everything looks really good, but I really want to bring out this one section, or I want to you know minimize another section. So yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, since you did your your mask on the girls. Or I'm sorry, since you overdid your mask on the girls, how do you remove yes. the overmasked area? Ah, so um, good question. So let's say we do not want them to look like ghosts. Um, then what I would do is I would go to my let's see, come on my adjustment layer and go to light. Um, so I would edit the mask. So go back to brush and either click erase up here in, in, the, in the brush toolbar, or I can hold down the option key or the alt key. And I, I don't know if this comes through here, but there's like a little plus and a minus in the middle of the, the cursor there that gives you a hint as to what you're doing. Um, and you can also, if you use the bracket, left and right bracket keys, um, you can change the size of that. And so then, uh, so I'm option clicking and just fine tuning where this is uh, being applied. So we're going to get rid of the fancy glow. What's nice is, I mean, you can see right away what's going on. In fact, uh, you know, like suddenly her fingertips are darker. She must be frostbitten. No, no, no. We'll just add this here. So once you have a mask, um, you can go back in by saying edit mask and doing brush uh, to, to edit specific parts of it. Uh, if I want, I can toggle so, I can, so that I always see the mask. Um, that, that also applies, like if you have, um, if you've added uh, like a, a radial mask or a, um, uh, you know, a, a gradient mask. Um, if you want to edit that, you, you would just go back into brush. So for example, like, like I'm going to add a gradient mask to this top portion, right? All right. So that's, Ooh, that's super bright. Yay. Brightness. Great. Um, but uh, too bright. So maybe I would say edit mask, brush, and then I can, you know, like just exclude this one's area. To make it extra artificial looking. Yeah. Great. Uh, I was trying to keep the questions specific to this topic, but we have a few that are a little bit random. So we are over an hour. If you're good on time, I'll go ahead and shoot them at you, Jeff. Let me know. I, I am good on time and I'm good for randomness. Okay. Uh, how do you feel Luminar handles Fuji RAF files compared to other editing programs? Ah, uh, that is a good eternal question. Um, so I, I shoot with the Fuji X-T3 um, and I think it, it does a perfectly fine job. Um, if you, you know, Go into super pixel peeping mode. Um, I think because of of the the sensor that Fuji uses, um, it can sometimes create artifacts that are um, sort of more noticeable, especially when you're doing sharpening. Um, I I don't get into that sort of detail to the extent that it matters to me. And I know that sounds like kind of a lazy answer, but um, uh, you know, I have no no qualms about editing my 
photos in Luminar or Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One or whatever. Um, it, it's my understanding that like, I think Capture One does a slightly better job because they've, uh, they've specifically uh, tuned Capture One so that it recognizes when there's a Fuji uh, image and, and like adjusts its algorithms, I think. Um, I haven't used Capture One in a while, but that's, that's my understanding. Um, but like, there's nothing about it that makes me say, oh, gee, I'm shooting a Fuji raw film and boy, I can't bring that into Luminar because it's going to turn it into garbage. Like that's, that's not the case at all. I think, um, you know, that's like, like another level of, um, you know, specificity. And for, for a lot of people, that's really important. Um, I think for, you know, 97% of the people, um, it, it's not. And, you know, it, it depends on what you're shooting. It depends on if you're, you know, shooting at high ISOs where you're going to see a lot more noise. Um, I'm trying to see, I have, I got a photo of, a, of an apple recently that um, I was like, oh, isn't this a beautiful apple? Uh, I don't have it here. Um, and uh, like, like just because it was dark and because it was um, uh, like, like the texture of the apple, uh, you could definitely see like this kind of squiggle pattern that is uh, endemic of the, the Fuji's processing. Um, and so like in that case, it wasn't great, um, but I, I actually saw that in all the different ones that I tried it in, so. Your mileage may vary, um, but it, it's not something that makes me go, oh, geez, like I can't do X or Y. Uh, is the brush a smart brush? It seems you're painting freely, but getting specific results. Um, it is not a smart brush. I'm just so good at it, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> it's, no, um, it, 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 it's not. It, it's not doing any sort of um, edge detection that I know of. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it has, let me go back into the, into the brush while it loads. Um, come back, black, white conversion. Um, this, so, so basically, uh, if you can see this close up, um, there's like an orange ring and that's sort of the, the, the core of what is going to be brushed. And then the area outside the orange ring to the black ring, that is a, um, a, the softness of it. And so as I'm painting, it's, it's getting some of the, um, I need to invert this. Um, it's, it's mostly painting in the middle with a little bit of fall off on the outside. How do you use luminescence masking in Luminar 4? Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, so I would encourage you to go, um, go see the, the previous webinar that talks about uh, masks and, um, and layers because we, we covered that there. Um, very, it's a very short way of explaining. Let me see if I can jump to this. Um, so luminance masking basically uh, looks at the at the lightness values of all the pixels and things that are lighter are selected and things that are darker have less of a selection. Um, let's see if I had an example. I think maybe I did it on this. So um, if I were to, okay, so um, this is an adjustment layer three. Let me say um, edit mask luminosity. And what it does is um, it, it basically just makes a black and white mask of everything. Um, and Let's see if I can make this work. What's what, luminosity masking is really good for something like like a waterfall pick. Probably shouldn't have done this with the with the black and white conversion. I should have done it with 
the light. Um, and the idea is uh, I don't want to affect any of the dark areas. I just want to affect all the bright areas. So in this case, um, if we could look at the mask, so I mean, I mean, the edit mask can say brush only so that we can look at the mask. And so it, it's not all red. Um, if you notice, like, like these areas here, which are the brightest in, in the image, uh, those are red, so those are masked. But this area over here, the rocks, has very little masking applied. So now, I'm gonna exit that. Um, so now if I want to say, I, I just wanna make the white uh, waterfall streams pop a little bit more, then I can just uh, use the white slider or the exposure slider. And you'll notice that, that just those areas are being affected. This, this darker area is not. Um, what's, what's especially good for something like this is uh, like you might have this, these areas that I think I've, I've done on another layer, but um, like it, it might be just too bright. And so like say you would add or you would adjust your highlights to add a little more definition to them. So that's the, that's the like three minute luminosity masking uh, explanation. That's right, that was our last webinar. So that's, that's up on our, the Rocky Nook YouTube channel and it's also on the Rocky Nook website. Um, if you look in the kind of menu bar at the top, there's uh, an item that says, I, I believe it says freebies and then you, that menu drops down and you can go to webinars and you can see Jeff's previous webinar there along with some other ones we have. Um, so last question. Okay. We have here. Um, I have noticed that when I open Luminar 4, when it brings up the last edited photo, there's a triangle with an exclamation mark in it in the left hand corner. Does that mean I've moved the location of the photo on my storage drive? Uh, I believe so. Um, yes. So, um, it, it means either it's moved or, or maybe um, that image was on an external drive that's no longer connected, or maybe it's, it's on a network drive. Uh, in fact, uh, if, we, if we look here, if you look down at the, the lower right, um, I have this, this Luminar NAS folder. I think this is what, what the, the questioner is asking about. Um, and what this means is right now, um, my, my NAS, my network attached storage drive is not currently connected. So Luminar knows that, it's, that it still belongs to my library, um, but it can't really do very much because it doesn't have the image available. So it's, it's kind of throwing that up to say, hey, hey uh, you know, I'd love to help you, but can't do it until the, that file is available. Great. So that is it for the questions we have now. Um, I just want to quickly remind everyone that You'll get another email tomorrow with a, a replay video of this webinar. And it'll also include the coupon code Luminar40. So you can get Jeff's uh, book, The Photographer's Guide to Luminar for 40% off from Rocky Nook. And if you already have Jeff's book, if you like Jeff's book, go ahead and leave us a review on Amazon or on the Rocky Nook website. Um, those really help us and help Jeff. And we really appreciate seeing what you have to say about the books as well. Uh, so Jeff, is there anything else you would like to say about your book or about this webinar today? Um, yes, I mentioned on Twitter that we will be giving away two uh, copies of my book uh, to people who are registered. So um, I believe the way we'll do that, I will pick two random numbers and give them to Mercedes and she will match them up with the list of people who registered and uh, she will contact you about uh, if, if, if you won. So. Cool. Does that sound like a good way to work? Sounds random and wonderful. <laughs> um, someone also just asked, can you include where to get the free black and white looks? Um, and that is going to be, oh, um, that sounds like something that would be good for, for the email. Is that something we can put in the email? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I, I will send that. Um, it is skylum.com slash luminar slash marketplace slash looks slash 53, because of course that's where someone will instinctively go looking for something like that. But yes, we'll include that. Great. 
thank you so much for your time today, Jeff. This was really helpful. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks to everyone who showed up. And again, look for that email tomorrow. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.